Once again, my name is Erin Gray. I am the manager of the Fault Planetarium, and tonight I will be talking about seeing space in unconventional ways. Since most often when you use sea space, you're not actually looking at it directly. So your eyes can only see so much in the night sky when it's dark out, and if it's really clear, you're far away from light. So the one thing you can do to help is to actually look through the telescope. And so you can start to see some details, maybe even Saturn's rings. But even beyond that, when astronomers want to do work, they have to get even bigger telescopes. And sometimes they're even off of the surface of the Earth. And even then, some of them bring back real images, like the Hubble Space Telescope. Some of them just bring back data, and then that gets transferred into a craft, and that's the visual. So how many of you here are astronomers or studying astronomy? Awesome. And how many of you are actually interested in space? I hope you see a lot of hands. Awesome. So just in that one comparison, there needs to be different ways to communicate science to people who are astronomers compared to people who aren't astronomers. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. So starting off, as I mentioned, my background is in both art and physics, and so I, and so we're going to be talking about artistic mediums to start off. And just to clarify, it is not this kind of medium. So when I was in undergrad, my final capstone piece as an art student was to create a gallery collection. And so naturally, I wanted to make it about physics data. And so what I did, I created those theories that I mentioned where there was a straightforward um, interpretation of that data, and then there was an artistic response that had that same data conveyed the same concept. And so for the astronomy piece, it looked like this. Oops, let me move that out of the way. So a lot going on here, but it is based on a binary system. So there were two different stars orbiting around each other. And so these are a stack of different types. So as observers were taking in the light whenever they eclipsed each other, there was a dip in what they were seeing, and then it carried on. But each one is back and going in time. And so where that dip happened, shifted back and forth. And so you can start to see it here in this sinusoidal shaped curve. And so each different layer is in a different point in time. And so if you take it apart a little bit, you can see it a little bit here where we have specific areas where that dip shifts. And so for the scientific piece, what is more straightforward and very clear, transparent than literal glass? So in this case, the glass pieces going back are representing time. And you can see that here from this angle. And if you view it more straightforward, you start to see that curve shape. For the artistic response piece, they look something like this. And so I actually have one I can hand around if I can find a assistant. Thank you. And so this is crochet copper wire, where if you imagine one of these graphs and you connect this end over to this end and you get a loop and you have a dip. And so when you connect them together, you feed them into each other, mirroring that graph, place them along a side of sort of curve shape. You're hitting all of the same key pieces of information, even if it's not the actual data being represented. The concept is still there. And so uh, we're going to go on to continue this idea of how can we keep these constant concepts coming across, even if it's not 100% just the data straightforward. So as we keep continuing to learn about our world and studying with telescopes, we've discovered a lot of planets out there. So our planetary system is called the solar system. And other planetary systems out there, those planets are called exoplanets. And we know quite a large number of them at this point, but they've all been discovered by indirect methods. So nobody's actually seen them. But enough data has been gathered that we know enough about them, sometimes even down to what the atmosphere might look like, that we can have artist renderings based on the scientifically accurate data for what it might look like. And so this is important for about two and a half reasons. The half reason being for the scientists. They know the data, so they have a pretty good understanding of what it's about. Eventually, it's nice, but not super necessary. Important fact number one is for the public. So we want this to be something people can connect to, to have some kind of relationship with, get excited about, support these missions. Because the more support there is, the more funding there are for these missions. And the more funding, the more missions that we have. And then point number two is that it is inspiring not only to people, but also to kids. And it might encourage them to not only go into astronomy, but maybe even into science, maybe even into art. So there's a lot of other reasons behind these. And they also contain a lot of information. So if we go down to one of the surface of those planets, 
we can actually unpack this image and get a lot of the information back from what's going on. So a lot of these planets are tidally locked, meaning that one side is forever facing the star, one side is forever facing away, kind of like our moon is only ever facing one side towards us beyond the other. So you can see that divide happening right here where it's very cold and we have ice happening over here, but it's warm enough for liquid water on this side. Also, your central star is very, very large in this spot, about two to three times larger than our sun appears because the planets in this system all orbit much closer to that sun. And that's all evident here as well, with the other planets in the system being very visible in the sky. Whereas compared to us here on Earth, when we see other planets, they look like tiny little dots of light in our night sky. And so this is the Trappist-1 system. This one is specifically the 1F planet. I personally love the Trappist system. I love all the writings with them. I just think they're aesthetically gorgeous. A completely different exoplanet that is nowhere near habitable is 55 Cancer E, which is thought to be a lava world. So it has hot lava flowing on that side facing the sun but it's all solidified on the other side. So it's super cold over there. And you can actually see some of the dust streaming off here from the sides due to the radiation of the wind from that um, star that it's here. So there really is real information contained in this Im these images. And lastly, somewhere you would definitely not want to go is this is what scientists think the surface of a brown dwarf looks like. Um, which is very similar to Jupiter's great red spot. So very turbulent, violent, not really conducive for human life. But getting to see these images are great because we're not always going to be able to go to these places, one, see them from telescopes, but even say in the future, if spacecrafts develop where they can travel these very far distances, where some of these exoplanets are 40 light years away. Um, Two reasons why that might not work out. One, a lot of exoplanets are not habitable. So even if you could go there, you probably wouldn't want to go there. Two, even if a spacecraft could travel there, the time for that travel might exceed a human lifetime. So you still wouldn't physically be able to go there. But we're still in love with this idea of the possibility. And so, so is NASA. And so they actually created a series of travel posters based on all of these different exoplanets, pulling in the topics that they think um, the key facts of what these planets are to advertise them, kind of like the national parks advertise for them. Um, so for example, our lovely lava world, maybe you want to take a Sunday afternoon tour over the hot lava, just casually. Or on a much friendlier planet, going down to the surface of Kepler 816F, you might be wondering why the grass is redder on the other side, or as one of the artists said on this piece in particular, to add a sense of whimsy to make you wonder why would there be a white picket fence on an alien planet? So there is a fun side to this as well. And beyond just telescopes, helping us learn more about our universe, there are also different space missions that get lost, launched with different spacecraft. And we had one launched pretty recently as well, back on October 15th, which was called the Lucy mission. And so, the goal of this mission is to study the Trojan asteroids, which exist in the Lagrange points of Jupiter's orbit. So these are the very specific points where the gravity from Jupiter and the gravity from the sun are just about equal. So these asteroids orbit pretty stable right where they are. And they are among the oldest known asteroids. And so Lucy's goal is to go observe them, <clears throat> collect data, and then send it back to Earth. And so our goal is to try to understand how our solar system was formed. However, this is a very long mission. <clears throat> it's about 12 years total. So how do you keep people engaged for that long? Well, you start with explaining it to kids. And so they've turned Lucy in this quite adorable little cartoon. And with this cartoon, they actually create a whole series going through the development stages of how the spacecraft was built, what is the goal of the mission, and what will Lucy do, and what are the specific eight targets that she will visit. So here's a short clip from the beginning of that series. <coughs> we are minutes away from the launch of NASA's Lucy mission to the never before explored Trojan asteroids. Okay. Audio is Lucy's off. long journey to space right begins today, but, but her story you get to actually started years ago. And learn all about her. And so they have a few other videos that were done in this style. And so we have a friendly little alien friend who somehow designs a rocket that goes very close to the speed of light. And its goal is to go on an intergalactic vacation. 
And so your narrator is the only one talking. It says, hey, maybe this isn't a good idea, but if I can't stop you, here are some things that you should know if you're gonna go down this route. What are some things that you need to be careful of? And so in these um, videos, Near Light Speed 101, really effects of near light speed travel. So, in this one, in First, a lot of weird things can happen, happen like time and space so getting all bent out of shape. For example, if you're moving at nearly the speed so of light, according to the clock inside your rocket, you'll only take a bit more than half the time to reach your destination compared to what a clock on your planet would say. And so it goes on to explain these really complex ideas, but bringing you back to something very tangible, which is the idea of going on a vacation. And then our friend decides, hey, I actually want to go visit a black hole. And immediately the narrator says, don't. But if I can't stop you, then here are some things to know. How to identify them? What are the different types? What are some things to be aware of? So it's some really complex nebulous ideas that are explained in a very user-friendly way. And they're fun not only for kids, but also for adults. I think I've watched almost all of them at this point. <laughs> a different kind of... Um, Way to share this not only would be looking at it online, but you could also share it through a classroom. But again, this is all done on a flat screen. So a different type of screen that you could look at is an immersive digital media, of course, the planetarium. So in the cult planetarium, we have a piece of software called Starry Night, which lets us look at the stars from any date, time, location from the surface of the Earth, as well as any surface for any planet in our solar system. All of the data contained within this piece of software is accurate and real. So the places of the stars, the nebulas, um, galaxies, everything that we know in the entire universe. And so instead of having a complete video or something like that that's produced, it becomes a tool. So we can use it to a varying level of degree. So we can break it down into three major categories, starting with kids. So we were fortunate to have one full day of field trips where we had 100 first readers in our audience, which was incredibly fun. And so we talked about different North Carolina education standards for first graders, such as the faces of the moon, what it looks like and why they happen. We also talked about the constellations. And then in particular, we talked about there's some major, but over in the northern part of the sky over here, specifically because it contains the asterism, the Big Dipper. And so if you look at the Big Dipper, it can help you find Polaris, which is the North Star, so you can always find your way and since we were talking with kids, when talking about the Big Dipper, we mentioned Merak and Duby are the pointer stars. And so, of course, to get from Duby to Polaris, we had to scooby dooby do our way down there. And so our medium intermediate category would be for a general background population, which right now is just our campus population. And so each month I produce something that's called What's Up HBU. So these are short pieces that talk about the current night sky for different stars, constellations, and that's that you see, but it's all done through a theme. So depending on the month, what events are happening, what holidays take place in that month, that becomes the theme that everything is seen. And what's great about this is that it allows us to bring in outside content, specifically for travel. So for example, in the summer night sky, Vega is a very bright prominent star, and it is located right near the center of an HR diagram, where there is a tie between the hotness of a star, as well as what Sense, but it's also counterintuitive, where your blue color stars are actually much hotter than anything that's that kind of orange red color. <clears throat> it is also near the center of the apparent magnitude system, which is also counterintuitive, where the higher numbers are actually painter stars and the lower numbers are brighter stars. And so we also have one last layer, of course, for our astronomy classes. This is used to help in the different topics that they're learning about, and you can see all the different things from different angles rather than on a static flat to the surface. But what happens when you can't keep using visuals to help you explain different things? What happens if somebody doesn't learn through visuals very well? Or what if somebody is blind or visually impaired? What do you do next? What is your method? You can't choose any of these other things. So one thing that we can do is turn to one of our other senses, and again, going through the lens of art, that brings us to music and sonification. And so sonification is defined as the process of making sound, but more specifically here, sonification is a non-speech audio that is used to convey information or to perceptualize data. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. And 
And so there's a piece of software called Afterglow Access that was actually developed at UNC by Dr. Dan Reichart. And it's used to analyze images that came from Skynet. And where Skynet is a series of robotic telescopes where you can control them remotely and you get back images. And so with this software, you are able to analyze these different videos through audio. So as the bar speaks up, you hear different notes depending on the placement or where these different things are. And as they are brighter, you hear them as being louder. And since we are currently having an issue with audio, I'm gonna grab my phone really quick and I will play you this audio so that we can all learn how to identify these different objects that you see here. All right, so this first image that we see here is a low density star field. And so I'm gonna play the video, but also pay attention to the audio that's happening here. Okay, so it didn't line up perfectly, but the main idea here is that it was all over the place. You heard a bunch of random tones, as you can see, with some of those really bright spots in that image. And so that's how you would identify, okay, so that's some kind of star field. There's no main one central bright image. Absolutely. I agree. It gets better. So the central image is M82. So this is a galaxy in the Messier catalog. And once again, we'll take a listen to it and then we'll dissect what it is that we're hearing and how listening it, we can understand what the image is representing. I'm going to do that one more time and sync up the audio with the visual. So did you catch that second time around that it sounded kind of like scale in there? Where you had the stepping of the notes since we have our galaxy on the diagonal. So if it had been perfectly up and down, you would have heard one single note, a very long hallback. If it was perfectly equal, you would have heard all of the series of notes all at once. So knowing that we heard it as stepping like a scale, we know that this is the diagonal. And since we didn't hear random all over the place, just like the first with the star field image, we know that this is some kind of um, galaxy that is on a diagonal. And so the last image that we we'll take a look at is on the surface of the moon, which is quite different than the first two. So it's a little bit off end, but in this one, the notes were much more drawn out. They were very short and staccato. And you can hear where some of those craters were, specifically that really bright one. And so you know that we're not looking at some star field gap. We're looking at something that is much smoother. And so now that we kind of understand what this process is, let's put it to the test. I will give you a piece of audio, and then I will show you some images, and I would like you to guess which one it is. And if I have any volunteers that would like to answer, I have a sticker of ISS up for grabs. So, here is round. This will be the first playthrough of the audio. Okay. Here are your choices. 
Okay, I saw one hand first. And you would be absolutely right. Congratulations. So this is the most sensory version of going to sonification. And as you see, it's pretty easy to pick up. And so one of our professors at HPU is actually doing outreach with students at the university where they're interacting with kids and teaching them how to use the software, how to go to the same process, understanding the image um, through audio, which is really neat. But what happens when it's more complicated? So right now, we're just looking at a static, um, we're just looking at a black and white image. But what happens if we introduce other lines of light? So the visible light spectrum is a very small part of the large electromagnetic spectrum. And so there are wavelengths that exist beyond what our eyes can take in. But there are telescopes that can see in these wavelengths. So what if we pull in some other data and overlap it all together? It gets very complicated, but it also is very beautiful. So in this Chandra X-ray Observatory, that's exactly what they did. Not only did they pull data from their telescope to others as well, in an image of the black center of the Milky Way galaxy. And so once again, I will manually play the audio as we watch the video. So in this case, it's much more like an orchestra or some kind of there's so many things going on in the background. It's a little bit harder to get into the heart of it and understand it like we were just doing, but we start to get down a little bit, at least into the main components. So from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, they were looking mostly at X-ray wavelengths, and they are the xylophone, which is some great alliteration there. And as it goes through, just like we went through with the Afterglow software, as it makes its way across, there's a tone from top to bottom, and how bright things are, are how loud they are. And anything that's that kind of that, um, yeah, nebulous background is going to be a much more important sound rather than a single note like a star would be. Right, so you get that there are high notes that are in there. And then if we go ahead and our infrared wavelength, that came from the Spitzer Space Telescope, is represented by the piano. And then ending with our visual look, we come back to our friend, the Hubble Space Telescope, as a violin. So we start to at least pick apart where these different sounds are coming from, and then it gets a little bit more complicated there to understand what's actually going on. So now in our journey through, how well can we share astronomy? We've covered two of the five classes. So that leaves us with three other options for what can we do next? Do we, we don't want internet connection, that's possible. Um, should we go with taste? Do we really want to taste all of these different things to try to understand the astronomy behind the things out there? You can say yes, I'm going to say no. Candy is fine and fun, but I think it should stay there unless being in a group. There does exist stuff out there that contains the 10 billion, billion liters of cosmic alcohol as well as other chemicals. And apparently, it contains such a chemical where raspberries get its taste from. And so, it is theorized that it will smell taste like raspberry rum. However, we cannot confirm this one because toxic chemicals, too, is very far out of their taste. So, just so we're on the same page now, we're going to go with tough. So, everything uh, when you're being a telescope, um, Telephone, where you're passing it down the line, telling people what they how messed up that gets on the way, trying to play taboo or things get lost in translation. 
So let's play one more little game. So, has anybody seen the image before? If you have, keep it to yourself. So here we're going to start with this person. So I have skeleton for you. You know, we have a small tail up here. We have some really big feet, long legs. Think what that animal would be. Just up here. I'm going to show you how scientists would draw this animal. You know, how good the is. But now I'm going to show you what this animal really is. So. So sometimes we need a little bit more guidance to make sure we know what we're doing to help guide the mind's eye to make something realistic. And so we have reached tactile space. No, you can actually touch space for real, but you can make things that help you understand space itself. So I have a familiar example of such things. These are different books, books that as well as Braille. So not only are there images that have raised services to them, anything on that page is printed out as an identifier and the key is also translated into Braille. You just hand this to somebody who's blind or really impaired, they can explore it on their own and understand exactly what we're looking at. For example, looking at this tactile in particular, this is of a specific crater that was thought to be an impact basin, so it has these really defined specific ridges here in the center, and we can actually have a side view of the region, fully understand what's going on. And so, a handful of these books like this out there, and so far, they've also come with educator guides. So, even if you don't really know anything about this topic, this educator guide can help you be able to guide this person through the book so that it's accessible to you, so you can make it accessible to them. And lastly, in order to try to reach through this field of accessibility even a little bit more, in today's day and age, 3D printers have become more accessible. They're not so sporadic, um, out of reach as 3D. And so, things can be 3D printed now as Hubble images. This was the goal of a team of astronomers from the Space Telescope Science Institute to create a project called 3D Astronomy where they were able to match scientific data into things that 3D printers read and print. And so we were able to do that for specific examples. And I was able to download one and print it from one of our 3D printers as well. So I have one last piece to yeah. And so this day, which is a very complicated process for them, too, so it's not, something you can just drag and drop any image into, but they were able to figure out, okay, what are the key features that we want to emphasize in these images, and how can we put them into textures that would be easily recognized. So for example, as a person of the real image into the 3D version, we're going to fade it up slow. So you can start to see where to go with this. And so there's a key to help you understand what all these different tactiles mean. And it was tested in different ways to find what is the best route. And one, it's really cool, but it's making something that's completely how do you talk about something like this into something that sounds a little bit more accessible. Yes, it takes a little bit more time to really understand what you're looking at, but it's not impossible. And so it's a clear right step in the realm in order to get astronomy um, out there and to make astronomy accessible to everyone. And overall, these are just a few different key areas that I personally was interested in based on my crown, and nonetheless are not able to go out, but specifically through the realm of accessibility um, to bring people astronomy.